Good afternoon, evening on this Thursday. I'm going to start with a question. Do you know how many decisions the regular adult human has to make on a daily basis? It's something like 33,000. So 33,000 to 38,000 is like one research project. Do you feel overwhelmed by that many decisions? Well, I certainly do, but you know what? I promise after just these 30 minutes we're going to spend together, you can become a better decision maker starting tonight. So let's get started. Welcome to The Leader's Boss. Welcome to The Leader's Pause, where leaders like you tune in to find calm, get clear, and level up. Tune in with best-selling author, speaker, and coach Hal Runkle as he helps you take back your time, your energy, and your decision-making power. All you have to do is learn to press your own pause button first. So take a break, take a breath, take a knee, and learn to access your greatest human superpower, the ability to pause, think, and decide for yourself. It's time to find calm, get clear, and level up. The Leader's Pause starts now. Good evening. So, who am I? I'm Hal Runkle. This, what is this? This is The Leader's Pause, and it is a show where we intentionally take a break from all the noise around us, all the noise within us, so that we can reflect, think, and eventually decide. It's vital that we learn to do this skill. It is among the most important skills. You know what? I would say it is the most important skill to be an effective human being, certainly to be a leader and to make better decisions, which in many ways is the definition of a leader, is somebody who intentionally strives to make good decisions. Because we all, when we decide, we certainly make an influential impact on whatever's going to happen next, on anybody that's around us. And that means there's a lot of importance to it. We all recognize this, but how many of us would openly confess, decision making is hard because I'm indecisive? That would certainly be me. I'm a coach. I coach executives, usually in midlife, who are dealing with very difficult people problems within their organization or within their family. And the difficulty is, what do I do? And how do I make that decision? How do I evaluate what's coming up, evaluate what's going on, so that I can choose a decision? And what criteria do I want to use to make the decision? And then how do I handle the fallout from it? Just those questions alone can be overwhelming, and so it makes us just want to throw up our hands and, again, just confess, well, I'm, uh, I'm indecisive. And decision actually is a decision. Behind me on this uh, wall, this is my studio. It's Studio 34. And uh, if you can uh, guess why it's called Studio 34, um, I will uh, always send you a free book. So that is uh, email me at hal at halrunkle.com and you can get a free book if you guess why I named this Studio 34. Now, behind me, I think behind me there is a poster of the, of the rock band Rush. Uh, who I grew up listening to. This this room is surrounded with all the things I loved as a kid. And that was one of the things I loved. And they have a song called Free Will. And you can choose not to decide, but uh, you still have made a choice, is one of the famous lines from that. And indecision is a decision. It's a decision to delay another decision. But, like we said in the opener, we're making 33, 38,000 decisions a day. Now, thankfully, most of those are on autopilot. But so much of our success depends on evaluating some of those decisions on autopilot and beginning to question those. Question your automatic instincts. Question your automatic reactions. So much of what we talk about on the leader's pause is moving away from being reactive, which is totally fueled by our primal emotions, and instead choosing to be responsive, which is a completely different uh, way of being in the world. 
And it's a way that only humans can do. Animals cannot be responsive. They can be reactive, just going on their instincts, but they cannot be responsive. We can, but when we don't, when we don't choose to pause, when we don't choose to think through about the decision that's in front of us, when we choose to delay the decision in front of us, what we're doing is acting out of our animal primary, primal animal instincts, which, you know, at, if, a, if a, a bus is, is heading towards you, it's great. How many times do we act as if a bus is heading toward us and we get reactive, just like the slightest misinterpretation of a comment from our partner, from a, a, a re, quick reading of numbers that are delivered to us in, in, a, in a profit and loss statement, from bad news that we see on the news or see the, the, just scrolling through social media and seeing things we find uh, upsetting or that we're jealous of or envious of. It is the easiest thing in the world to be reactive. It is, the most, it is far more difficult to be responsive. And yet, the most successful people in the world and your successes that you've had in life have always come when you have chosen to intentionally set aside the reaction that maybe your body is screaming for you to make and in choosing instead to make a response. Now, this doesn't mean that if you choose to respond, it doesn't mean that what you choose is going to be the right decision, the perfect decision. It just means you're giving yourself a chance to at least have a decision that comes from the right place. What is the right place? It's that place where we can only access when we are at our calm. And it's that place that thinks about the things that we want most. And tries to align our decisions to move us in that direction. This is something I, I, I try to live my life by. It's something I preach a lot on the page, on the stage, in shows like this. That failure is whenever we abandon something we want most for something we want right now. And the right now part is the reactive part. For example, something I want most is a healthy, fit body that's functional, that, uh, you know, is, is reasonably attractive to my wife. Um, something I want right now, Krispy Kreme donuts. The absolute weakness that is my kryptonite. And Krispy Kreme is everywhere. I, I'm a grown man. I can drive. I can pay $7.79 for, you know, half dozen donuts. And I have. And I'm sure that at some point I will. But I cannot continue to do that without actually saying no to that body that I want most. Well, if I'm not pausing enough to reflect and think through how to make my decision, then I'm going to be at the whim, at the mercy of whatever is pulling me right this minute. And that can be bodily functions, that can be um, what I'm interpreting, bad interpretations of what I'm interpreting going on around me. We're making decisions all the time. How about we just get more intentional about it? Now, at the end, towards the end of the show, or in the second half of the show, I am going to teach you two techniques that I have taught others, that has been taught to me. It is something I practice with my coach. It is something I practice as a coach with my clients. They are two techniques that absolutely will improve your decision-making starting tonight. We will get to those in the second half of the show. First, why is it so hard, why, why it's so hard and why is it so important to be a good decision-maker? What's interesting is like, I started my career as a parenting expert, and I got to go around the world, spoke like 20-something countries, and became a New York Times bestseller with a book called Scream Free Parenting. And one of the things I learned going around the world is, regardless of all of the variety of traditions and principles and uh, religions and, and that come from nationalities and races and, and different living experiences, everybody wants the same thing. Every parent eventually wants the same thing. Every single one of us. We want a kid who turns into an adult who can make good decisions. Every single one of us. That's what we want. Because that's the only way we can rest assured that we have raised them into a productive adulthood, is have we 
do we get to see them make good decisions? Now, the difficulty is we all want them to be good decision makers, but it's very difficult and we don't necessarily want to help them become good decision makers because that means we've got to give them, recognize them to them, empower them to make decisions. And so many times that's not what we want to do. We, our fear says we just want them to do what they're told. And so maybe that's what you learned. I'm not a decision maker. I'm a rule follower. Who decides whether or not to follow the rule? Talking to a three-year-old. Tell you're telling a three-year-old what to do. Who decides whether or not they do it? The three-year-old. Making decisions. Already. Making decisions from the moment they come out of the womb. Now, these are not, these are instinctive decisions, but they are decisions like decision whether or not to eat, decisions whether or not, now they're not thinking through them, but our job is to help them see they're already making decisions, and it's our job to help them learn to be more conscious of that, but we've got to do that ourselves. Why is it so important? Because it's the only way we have a stamp on the world. Our decision making is what gives us a measure of relative agency. It is what give, makes us autonomous. It's what gives us an actual impact is by choosing to decide. That's why it is so vital. It is the only way for us to stand our grounds, the only way for us to make our case. It's the only way for us to make our way in the world in any sort of intentional manner. That's why it's so vital. Why is it so hard, though? Well, because it's so vital. And we're afraid making a decision, going in this path, is going to lead us down. And so we want to keep our options open for as long as possible, delaying the decision. Well, this has, I think, gotten worse in the last 40 years because we are so surrounded by media that makes us aware of so many other options constantly. There's this amazing scene in a uh, movie, uh, The Hurt Locker, won Best Picture in 2006. It's, it's about a war in Iraq. And uh, there's a powerful scene where uh, the main character, played by Jeremy Renner um, of Marvel fame, he returns to the States after his first tour and he's, they just show him in a grocery store line looking at cereal boxes. And he is completely overwhelmed by the amount of choices. And it makes no sense to him. Because the world he just came from, his choices were very, very focused. And in many ways, that strict of an environment makes your decision making easier because it's eliminating so many extraneous decisions. I just have to decide when to get up. I have to decide, right, how am I going to follow these orders as opposed to I got to decide what to buy in this grocery store with 4,000 items that I'm looking at. And so it, what it makes him do is want to just run back to war. And I think that's a, an amazing illustration because in the name of escaping the danger of making a wrong decision, he do chooses to go to a place where he's actually literally in danger, but it makes more sense, and he doesn't have to make as many choices. Well, that's what we do. We do it when we procrastinate. We do it when we delay our decisions. And why is that? Well, let's break down the word for a second. Decide. I want you to write this down. Decisions are murder. And you can take that a lot of different ways. They can feel like murder because it's so hard on us and we don't like to do it. Decisions are murder, but they are actually literally murder. Decide. Same uh, antonym as homicide. Or antonym? I don't know. Whatever the thing at the end is. Same as homicide, same as suicide, decide. It is literal murder. That's what that phrase means, side. So, we are literally murdering off the other options. And we don't like killing. Most of us are not 
killers. And that's what's so difficult is we're facing this prospect of murdering off all the other choices that I can't return to once I've gone down this path. And so that means eliminating my options, which feels like eliminating my optionality, where now I'm locked in. Now, when we come back from the break, we're going to see how this is actually a myth. It's not actually true that it's totally locking you in. But I want you to think, as we go into the break, I want you to think, what's a decision you're facing right now? What's a decision that is on your plate right now that you have been delaying? And then we'll think about that when we come back. And eventually, I, mean, I am, and remember, I'm going to tell you the two things, two techniques that will absolutely improve your decision making starting tonight. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Pause. I am your host, Hal Runkle. I am a coach and an author and a speaker. You can always reach me at hal at halrunkle.com. And we are taking a pause today to talk about decision making, about the role it plays in our lives and about why it's so difficult. And that's what we ended right before the break. We were talking about why it's so difficult. And the reason is because decisions are murder. We are literally killing off the other options, decide, homicide, suicide. It's all murder, killing, and we don't like killing, and so we get anxious about it, and we want to keep our options open. I've got um, a couple of friends in mind, one in particular growing up, and that was, we all just reckoned he couldn't decide on the girl, he couldn't decide on the major, he couldn't decide on a career, and has struggled his whole life to make those kinds of decisions because he's so afraid. But what if I don't do this? Uh, you still have made a choice. You, the, you can choose not to decide, but you still have made, actually have made a choice to delay that decision. Well, that means there's no escaping decision making. It's all around us. And it's before us. And so we've got to get good at murder. It sounds crazy, but we've got to get good at murder, meaning we've got to get comfortable with the idea that I've got to make a decision in order to move. You can't move. Even moving this hand right here is a decision. We've got to make decisions. And so we've got to embrace the fact that we're going to miss out on what could have been. FOMO is a... a a wild excuse that we use to keep options open for as long as possible sometimes. But we have, to rec we have to embrace that and recognize, okay, we're going to. But here's the deal. You are not getting trapped by your decision. It feels like that. You're not getting trapped by your decision because you've got so many more decisions that are going to come because of the decision you just made. And ma now maybe that's part of the fear. You're going to make this decision. It's going to lead you in a direction, right? I'm going to decide on this major, and then that's going to do this. I'm going to decide to date this person, and that's going to lead me to this. You've still got so many decisions to make after that. Welcome to adulthood. And in and, and many, it, it starts long before adulthood. Welcome to being a human being. Embracing the fact that we have to be good killers in order to make decisions. And this is can be scary, because we have this fantasy, and, and we see it in commercials, no boundaries whatsoever. You know, it's, it's an SUV on a, on a Lake Tahoe, and it's able to go wherever you want it to go. It's a Jeep that can go off-road, and so, yay, it's, you know, no decisions. And it's interesting that they use that, because if you think about it, the, the, the Jeep, the automobile came after a mode of transportation that was more locked in. Trains. It could only go on the tracks. Now, once the tracks were laid and it decided to stay on the tracks, then it could go really far with a lot of people in a, in a, in a, in a quick amount of time. Cars allow us to go a lot more options around. That's why we like them. And yet, still, we've got to decide on a direction. Here's the truth. Decision, good decision makers do not pause for very long because the fear of making the right choice, picking the right direction can overwhelm us. 
Now, I know that sounds crazy on a show called The Leader's Pause. I'm not saying not to pause, but I am saying that the best decision makers do not pause for very long because they allow that fear, that fear of missing out, that fear of being trapped. They allow that fear. Uh, pausing too long allows the fear to overwhelm us and dominate us and eventually delay us. So the best decision makers, they do a quick evaluation process. It's one of the techniques I'm about to teach you. A quick evaluation process that helps them not make the perfect decision because there's no such thing, but it makes them move in a direction because they know another decision is going. Just remember this, and it's been said by lots of people wiser than me. Good decision makers take just a little time to decide to evaluate and make a decision and don't change their mind. The worst decision makers take a long time processing every single possibility, then eventually reluctantly sort of make a soft choice in one direction and are yet quick, very quick and apt to change their mind at the slightest possible resistance to this new direction. We've all been both, actually. There's been times when you've done it. What decision are you facing right now? Is it a job decision? Is it to fire a person? Is it to hire somebody? Is it to date somebody? Is it what to do about your kids struggling in school? We're facing lots of big decisions. So here's the trick. The best decision makers recognize there's no perfect choice. First thing, there's no perfect choice. What I can do is eliminate the most obvious bad ones. So, you know what? I lied. I said I was going to teach three techniques. I'm going to, oh, two techniques. I'm actually going to teach three. So here's the first one. Evaluate, take a pause, and evaluate the worst extreme options. Okay, how to handle this argument with your colleague. Well, just get absurd. What's the worst? Well, the worst could be I blow up at him tomorrow first thing and I scream and I make a huge scene about it and tell him how he's terrible and wrong. Okay, great. Are you going to choose that? God, I hope not. You won't. But establish it as, okay, on the one extreme, that's that. What's the other extreme? I never bring it up. I just hope it goes away so I don't have to actually address it. And I pray I don't resent him and me or avoid it, and whatever work may happen, may not happen, because I'm afraid to deal with this. Now, unfortunately, that may not sound like an extreme to a lot of folks, because most of us avoid confrontation like, a, like the plague until it can't, be denied, it can't be avoided anymore. But I'd like for you to establish that as, all right, an extreme. So if I'm not going to do every, if I'm not going to scream like a wild banshee and I'm not going to completely avoid, all right, so I've narrowed my options. I've narrowed the option field so that I've got a better understanding of, okay, what's the frame run? Because the more you do the, uh, those wild extremes, the more you recognize, okay, I'm not going to make a horrific decision because I'm not going to make one of the extremes. That's why it's important to name them. Name the extreme possibilities here. You've narrowed it a little bit more. It's kind of given you some train tracks to go forward. All right, here's, an, here's the second technique. The decision deadline. Make a decision about when you have to make the decision. Five o'clock, three o'clock on Friday, I am making the decision and I'm not going back. Tell somebody about it. Hold yourself accountable to it. Make whatever decision. Wait, delay, procrastinate until, you, until that very second. But at that very second, you make that decision. And you live with it. And you stand up tall and you look yourself in the mirror and say, I may be you know, making a mistake here, but the bigger mistake is not making a decision out of fear. That's the bigger mistake. So, 3 o'clock Friday, I'm going to decide on my... Uh, job choice. I'm going to decide on whether uh, or not to call my mom and talk to her about the very difficult issue. I'm going to decide how to handle this thing with my kids. I'm going to decide whether or not to keep this employee. I'm going to decide whether or not to ask for a raise. I'm making that decision at that time. The nice thing about you put it on the calendar even, 
put an event on your calendar. The nice thing about that is it kind of gives you a relief from all the pressure you're ha feeling in the moment to make the right decision right now. No, I'm, I've got plenty of time to evaluate, and I'm going to. The decision deadline is actually a lifeline because it gets you in the habit of recognizing. Once you start doing it, you recognize, all right, that decision, that wasn't that bad. That wasn't that hard. You do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. Because I will say, some of the, one of the biggest um, inhibitors to our good decision-making is our own lack of self-confidence about our decision-making ability. Well, the only way to get better at anything is to do it. Well, you are doing it all the time. We're just talking about doing it a little more intentionally. Here's another technique. And this is the one that I love the most. I want you to forever, ever, ever ban yourself from ever... Uh, doing a pros and cons. That's what we all do. Pros and cons, pros and cons. But that is not helpful. Not helpful at all. What is helpful is the cons and cons. Because when we start talking about pros, then we can get too a little fantastical in our mind, imagining the possibility, the positive possibilities. And that can lure us away from the stark realities. And the stark realities are the cons. So every choice has a cost. Like we talked about, you're murdering off other options. Well, one of the best ways I've ever seen is a, called a cost-cost analysis. You don't line up the pros, you just line up the costs. Okay, so the costs of me keeping this employee are this. And the costs of me firing this employee are this. The costs of me bringing this up to my spouse is this this. The cost of not bringing it up to my spouse is this. Then you look at those lists because they're lists of big negatives, things you don't want in your life. But you're going to have some negatives because there's a cost to every decision. It's one of the reasons why we avoid them. So don't look at the pros, look at the cons. Which of these costs am I more willing to live with? 20, what is it, 2,600 years ago, the, the Buddha said that all life is suffering. Here's how we begin, and I think that's true. There's so much suffering in, in all of life, but here's how we begin to stake a claim. We get to choose our suffering. That's the great thing about making decisions, is I get to choose which suffering I'm willing to live with, which opportunity I'm willing to forego because I'm choosing this opportunity. That gives me, again, a sense of agency, a sense of autonomy that I am able to stake my claim on this earth while I'm here by doing this. And I know it's going to come with these costs, but I am more willing to accept these costs than those costs. So think about whatever decision you're facing. Big decision you're facing. Put a deadline on it. Then eliminate the obvious things you're not going to do. Eliminate the obvious extremes. Then do a cost cost analysis choose which ones you can cost you can live with and go forward my friend it's been a great show i will see you in a couple weeks you have been listening to the leader's pause with hal runkle the show that helps leaders like you find calm get clear and level up Tune in every first and third Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio to access your greatest superpower, the ability to pause, think, and decide for yourself. Book a conversation with Hal today. Visit halrunkle.com.